Okay, so welcome everybody to the uh, Institute for Historical Research Transport and Mobility uh, Seminar. It's great to see so many familiar names and faces. Uh, I hope you're having a good evening. So firstly, I need to flag, I want to flag the, the next seminar, which will take place on the 16th of December. Uh, and actually it will be myself talking uh, about uh, Christmas uh, travel or Christmas marketing uh, by railway companies in the Edwardian period and how that related to transport use and transport, uh, why people went away. So this evening we've got um, Owen Karlstrom, uh, who is a retired chartered civil engineer. Uh, Owen uh, completed the MA in railway studies uh, with uh, myself, um, uh, well, the year before last or last year? Um, 20. 20. 2020. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this, what we'll be hearing tonight uh, is based on his dissertation research, which was uh, about the rhubarb triangle and the transition uh, of rhubarb traffic from rail to road. And I'll, I'll you know, flag something there. I, I don't like rhubarb, so um, uh, I have to hold my tongue on that one a bit um, <laughs> about um, how much I dislike it. But uh, now Owen has used this dissertation and ta taken it on to uh, form the basis of a PhD that he's currently undertaking with the York Management School. And uh, that is uh, more broadly on seasonal traffic, uh, the transition from rail to road between uh, 1920s and uh, the 1980 or so. So uh, before I hand over to Owen, uh, I'll just say, uh, if you've got any questions, please can you leave them to the end or pop them in the chat and I will happily pick them up uh, in the Q&A session at the end. So thank you very much. And I will pass over to Owen, thank you. Thank you, David. I'll just do the technical stuff, sharing the screen, um, assuming that I can. Uh, and let's just check. Can you all see that? Uh, yeah. It's gone on to the second page for some reason. There we go. So that's the, uh, uh, everyone happy with that one? Good. Uh, if we can see it, um, I'll carry on. And presumably I've got microphones turned on and everything else is working. <clears throat> there are a few familiar faces, David, you're right. There's also um, a few faces that uh, at least one that I probably need to behave in front of. So uh, I will do my best. So, as David said, this talk arose out of my master's dissertation on the rhubarb triangle, um, which used a case study approach to examine the transport of forced, forced rhubarb, which is, after all, a very seasonal product from West Yorkshire to London, the move from rail to road and the role of the rise of retail power and the demise of rail transported rhubarb. Um, and and the, 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 the MA seemed to go down all right uh, and uh, it wasn't entirely junked. So I subsequently prepared a proposal to extend this into a PhD, as David said, on, on seasonal produce, using a similar case study methodology, um, which uh, has been used before on, on some aspects of food transport, and I'll, I'll come on to that a bit later. So today I'm going to cover a, a brief look at the literature around forced rhubarb and seasonal produce, uh, and I'm sure you'll understand there's, there's not a great deal of it around. Um, and also retail developments, and, and um, uh, there's a lot more of that. What I'm not going to talk about in any great detail is the literature around the road rail competition and, and railway policy, um, as uh, there's masses of it, and uh, you probably all know quite a lot about it. Um, I'll then go on to talk about the substance of the forced rhubarb work, uh, and then uh, talk about a brief, the brief rationale for extending this to seasonal produce uh, as a PhD. Um, and I was lucky enough to get the proposal accepted and I'm six weeks into it, so please be gentle with me um, because uh, I'm what is known as a new PhD student. Um, so what is seasonal produce? Uh, it, it covers a very wide range of agricultural products and often shows the, the following common features. It's perishable, fragile and requires rapid delivery from producer to wholesaler. Uh, and there's a great deal of literature from the perspective of, of agricultural agronomy um, but there's not much on seasonal traffic and, and business analysis, although you can get up to date figures on things like soft fruit and broccoli production from organizations like the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations. Uh, 
Um, but when I was looking at rhubarb, the academic literature on the business aspects of rhubarb is, is very rare. There are four notable works. Um, Dorothy Turner wrote uh, The Economic Rhubarb from 1938, which uh, actually concentrated on the farming efficiency aspects in terms of what strains of rhubarb you should, uh, you should plant for the best, the best effect, uh, how, you, how, how you grow it, how you store it, how you harvest it, uh, and, and, and what, what are the economics of the various pricing systems. Uh, Richard Giles wrote a, a university paper, a Leeds University paper in 1970 uh, called Forced Rhubarb in the West Riding. And a fellow called J.M. Hughes wrote uh, the Rhubarb Industry Study in Depth, the running down of a local industry from 1976. Uh, and actually that particular paper, I, I, I tracked it down in the Leeds Local History Library after a lot of effort. And I was the first person since 1982 to book it out. Um, and they thought it was quite amusing. And I think it just shows it's a fairly arcane subject. Uh, lastly, uh, Anthony Silson uh, wrote a, a, an actual tour de force about forced rhubarb in West Yorkshire in 2018. Uh, and this is published by the Thorsby Society, uh, which is a local historical society in, in, in Yorkshire. Uh, now, of those documents, uh, Hughes and Giles tended to support each other in their sort of contemporaneous examinations of a declining industry. And because by the mid 70s, the industry was in quite significant decline. Um, and also their portrayal of a fragmented, locally significant industry. I'm sorry, that's my phone. It'll go off in a minute. Um, a locally significant industry run by hard-bitten and canny Yorkshire folk. Uh, and um, they, were, they were fragmented, they were very individual, and they were very independent. Uh, Silson, on the other hand, uh, takes a longer view from a greater distance and is perhaps more measured and arguably more dispassionate in his, his analysis. And, and Tony was in fact very helpful. Um, and I spoke to him on a number of points, um, not all of which we agreed on. Um, and one of those is uh, the famous rhubarb expresses we all heard about, uh, whether they were dedicated trains or not. I, I don't believe it. Um, he does, a lot of the popular narrative um, says that uh, they were dedicated as well. But we can have that argument later. But Tony was very helpful. Um, the more popular historical narrative of the rhubarb triangle, and there's a great deal of it, uh, is epitomized by uh, John Goodchild, um, who was, uh, he, he died in 2017, but he put together a very significant archive in Wakefield called the John Goodchild Collection, uh, which uh, consisted of a mass of historical material dating from the 1950s to, to his death in 2017. Uh, and one of his one of the examples of this popular history is the theory that World War II Ministry of Food have, uh, sent out inspectors to grub up forced rhubarb roots to turn them into green top jam, uh, thus almost destroying the forced rhubarb industry uh, during the war in the interests of, of feeding the nation. Um, and this is ubiquitous. It, it, almost everywhere you read any popular history about uh, rhubarb, this example comes up, but the math figures I find I found tend to contradict that theory, um, as we'll see later. Uh, looking to other possible case studies for seasonal produce, uh, the strawberry cultivation in the United Kingdom is looked at by uh, a number of sources. Um, A.D. Turner wrote a paper in 1962 discussing the development of the industry in the Cheddar Gorge, showing that special arrangements were agreed by what was then the Cheddar Gorge Strawberry Growers Association, which was a a powerful local body formed in about 1890 to transport the fragile product and that rail transport was thriving in the early 60s. So they forced the Great Western Railway to, to build special vans for them, specially ventilated, specially, uh, specially um, with special suspension. Um, and this is generally supported by uh, David Mitchell. Uh, it's not the David Mitchell that you may know, uh, this is another one who discusses the seasonal produce of the West Country, in particular strawberries, broccoli and tomatoes, which were all What's happening again, locally produced and also imported from Brittany via Plymouth. And of course, tomatoes came in in huge quantity from the Channel Islands and well, as well, um, none of which happens now to any great extent. Um, and th the period covered from say, 1870 to 1947 is generally regarded as, as, as an agricultural recessionary period uh, with low prices and profits. And, and the 1920s and 30s were famously recessionary, particularly for arable farmers as argued by Jonathan Brown in his, uh, his tour de force written in 87, Agriculture in uh, England, the survey of farming. Um, and actually the impact of all that on seasonal transport will be uh, an area of particular interest uh, for my project going forward. Uh, 
Now, the study of seasonal produce supply chains is also of necessity important and will contribute to understanding local agriculture's relationships to the growth of retail power and the various factors that encourage the proliferation of supermarkets uh, and increasing retail influence. Uh, this expansion, it's argued, was boosted by the Americanization of Europe after World War II, um, as suggested by Harper Boyd and Ivan Piercy in, uh, in the Journal of Marketing in 1963. Uh, and Ralph Jessen and Lydia Langer in, uh, in their book, um, Transformation of Retailing in Europe after 1945, support this in arguing Fordist ideas of mass consumption came to the United Kingdom after World War II. Um, more recently, Lawrence Black and Thomas Spain at, at York argue that the main influences in the rise of UK supermarkets were the removal of structural constraints, such as rationing, shortages, and resale price maintenance after the war, as well as the obvious economic benefits uh, of uh, supermarket um, development. But they also argue that after the war, conservative British shopping habits had to, had to be overcome. Gareth Shaw and Louise Curtin um, in uh, their book, The Self-Service in the Supermarket, and Adrian Bailey and Alexander in the, and Andrew Alexander in their uh, paper on uh, Cadbury and the rise of supermarket innovation uh, in uh, business history, um, uh, also agree that the 1964 abolition of resale price maintenance was a key enabler for the growth of supermarkets. And, and D.A. Cornby, who wrote uh, a very uh, influential paper on developments in the retail market, um, shows the uh, economic benefits of centralised retailer controlled distribution over fragmented wholesaler processes. Um, inevitably, as processes, the, 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 the logistics processes got more complex, supply chains uh, uh, became more complex as well. Uh, and Nick Harley in the Economic History of Great Britain argues that there was a transfer of value from pharma to other services as the supply chain grew more complicated, a greater proportion of product value accrued to service providers uh, rather than producers, possibly beginning the process of transfer transferring power away from farmers. Uh, Thomas Spain, in his, uh, his York PhD in 2016 on food miles, argues that following the demise of wagon load freight on the railways, uh, the vacuum was picked up by the growth of the motorway networks and allowed the supermarkets to exploit their growing power by picking strategic distribution locations at motorway intersections. Um, this, in effect, allowed the supermarkets to dictate production, packaging, the means and frequency of delivery. And uh, this will form quite a significant part of the thesis I, I'm hoping to write. Uh, as I've said, I'm not going to talk uh, in any great detail about the literature on rail policy and, and rail, 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 railroad competition. Um, it's, it's a vast subject and, and uh, I, I really wanted to get onto the, uh, the, the main menu which is uh, to discuss forced rhubarb. And my first task in doing this, uh, I think, is I have to explain a little bit about the, the history of forced rhubarb to put it in context. And I was surprised that for thousands of years, rhubarb was regarded as a medicinal plant uh, and it was grown in China and, and used almost exclusively for therapeutic purposes. And uh, for many, many hundreds of years, a substantial medieval trade uh, was, a, was in place between China and Europe. And I think it's rather nice to have this picture of presumably dried rhubarb being carried on the Silk Road between um, China and Europe uh, and obviously it shows somebody must have valued it highly because otherwise they wouldn't have gone to the trouble but it wasn't until the 16th century that medicinal rhubarb began to be grown in England and not until the early 19th century that it became uh, regarded as food and so uh, rhubarb growth in the early 19th century uh, became widespread in places like Altringham, Manchester and the outskirts of Glasgow but normally in small holdings uh, for personal consumption uh, or sale in the local markets and, and, and people had uh, surpluses, they would take them to the local markets and, and sell them as, as Roger Scola shows in his, uh, his book, Feeding the Victorian City. And uh, so forced rhubarb came late, uh, but forcing rhubarb to produce early and palatable crops was discovered uh, in Chelsea in the early 19th century. This is a process by which the green top rhubarb is kept in the warmth and dark, forcing the stems upwards to seek light and so producing extra sugar, uh, which gives an early harvest with some say superior characteristics uh, to summer crop rhubarb. Uh, and initially small producers merely covered the plants with forcing bottles to achieve this effect. Um, 
and latterly yield increases from about the 1860s, 70s onwards, 1860s were achieved by the introduction of forcing sheds, which required plants to spend two years in the fields before they were lifted and transferred to dark sheds for four to six months in the dark prior to harvest. And you can see here the difference between green top rhubarb and forced rhubarb. On the left, we've got something which I guess is very familiar to most of you. You've got the familiar greeny pink stems uh, with a very large leaf um, on, the, on top of them, which is of course full of oxalic acid. So if you eat the leaves, you're likely to become very ill indeed. Uh, forced rhubarb, on the other hand, you can see has longer, much pinker stems and the leaves are shriveled. And this is caused by the forcing process, which uh, hinders uh, the production uh, of glucose and uh, makes, the glu it makes the glucose stick in the, in the stems and uh, the leaves don't use all the energy of the plant. So you end up with this much sweeter um, uh, and uh, lots of people say more palatable product. And of course, the other benefit is that the forced rhubarb season is December to April uh, and the green top rhubarb is April to August. So if you're a canny Yorkshire rhubarb grower, you've extended your, um, your uh, season by uh, four months at a stroke. Sorry about that. And uh, you can see on the bottom left here, the rhubarb in the fields and it sits there for two years and after two years it's put into this long low shed which is heated in the 19th century by coal and it's kept in the dark for the six to 12 weeks and then harvested and it's harvested in the dark by hand even today by candlelight and uh, here you can see um, a, a canny Yorkshireman uh, getting his crop by candlelight. And if it's not done by candlelight and it's uh, the, full, the full light will actually significantly curb the, the forcing process. And um, it, will, it will very much hinder the, 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 the harvest. So by about 1865 to 1870, during the introduction of sheds, the forced rhubarb industry in the West Riding of Yorkshire, notably, uh, you can see here, Leeds, Morley, Methley, Wakefield and um, Bradford, uh, became known as the rhubarb triangle. This is a very untriangular triangle, but this is, it's, a, it's not an exact science. But this is the rough area that was uh, postulated by the Yorkshire Rhubarb Growers Society in the late 60s um, as, as what they, de they determined the uh, rhubarb triangle to be. And at the same time as this was becoming important, uh, Tom, Henry Mayhew, uh, who you may know from the book, uh, his book, uh, Mayhew's London, written in about 1860, was a great social commentator on, on uh, London um, poor society, commented in 1861 on the new availability of London of articles such as rhubarb, brazil nuts, and cowcumbers. But despite this growth and it becoming very fashionable in London, there's no record of rail transport to places such as Manchester and London until the late 1870s. And, and you can see there's uh, a very significantly developed rail system in the area and uh, we'll come on to the development of that uh, slightly later on. Uh, so the commercial history of forced rhubarb begins in the mid-1850s when it began to evolve from a localized market gardening enterprise into an embryonic west riding industry and there are a number of narratives as to why this was including the introduction of forcing sheds and both Turner and Silson credit a man called James Whitwell with their introduction. Um, Silson recognizes that Turner in uh, 19... Um, 1938, uh, recognizes Turner as the first person to mention Whitwell, although he does contest her dates and he investigates uh, in quite some detail the Whitwell family, showing that 1857, James exchanged a well-paid school teaching career in Lincolnshire to become a successful rhubarb seedsman. And he also goes on to suggest that the success of the Whitwell, Whitwell rhubarb operation was a significant influence in the development of the rhubarb triangle and that forcing sheds started at Osmondthorpe to the east of Leeds. And that's, that's here, and that's right on the edge of the triangle. And that's where James Whitwell set up his, uh, his um, first operation and, and uh, it is alleged where the first forcing sheds were built. Of course, there's one other important bit. I don't know why that happens, my apologies. Down here in uh, Fitzwilliam, uh, this is a very important part of the, um, rhubarb triangle because it's where Sir Geoffrey Boycott was born 
And I've often wondered whether it was something to do with his famous phrase that when he saw bad bowling, he'd say that his mother could have played that with a stick of rhubarb. Uh, whether it is or not, I don't know. Um, but other theories for the West Riding include the availability of manure from local conurbations, and of course, there have been considerable quantities of night soil from Leeds, uh, Wakefield, Dewsbury, and Bradford available. Uh, coal shale to put on fields, which were waterlogged by the subsidence caused by uh, mining um, activity underneath. And of course, this is back smack bang in the Yorkshire coal field. Um, and uh, there was a great deal of uh, subsidence. Um, smoke pollution and frost caused early leaf fall. And of course, we've already said that uh, uh, rhubarb has to go through two cycles of frost as a, as a precursor to forcing, to, to really uh, create the forcing, um, uh, to, to really benefit the forcing. Um, and uh, the other point was the skill of the local growers. Uh, Harwood, Wrong, Harwood Long, in his survey of the agriculture of Yorkshire from 1969 also argues that uh, the great tolerance of rhubarb to uh, unsatisfactory soil conditions was also a factor. And Stamp, who wrote his book, The Land of Britain, its uses and misuses in uh, 1947, I think, um, also points out that similar soil types and weather exist in other areas where forced rhubarb was grown and distributed, but never to the extent found in the West Riding. And other reasons given include the existence of a good rail network, the availability of nitrogen rich shoddy, which we'll come on to the, in a minute, and the availability of coal for heating the forcing sheds. But these, these uh, factors were there all along um, in other parts of the country. So I think uh, good child's argument that a series of extremely cold years in Britain from the start of the 1870s to about 1880 provided a stimulus to rhubarb growers as other fruit crops were severely weather damaged. And they looked at James Whitwell and saw him making money and uh, jumped on the bandwagon. But the, the message here is that basically the weather here is atrocious, the soil is atrocious, rhubarb loves it, and that's why uh, I think they went to, uh, to Yorkshire. Now I'm going to talk a bit about shoddy. Um, shoddy uh, has two sources. Uh, shoddy is the byproduct of the, the, the clothes recycling industry, of which Wakefield and Dewsbury were the, um, the centres in the, in the mid 19th century, and also from um, shearing sheep. So uh, there were loads of old clothes brought to the Yorkshire area by 1855, 13 million pounds of rags a year were sent up by rail to, uh, to be recycled. And the byproduct of that recycling uh, that was, uh, was fertilized, used as fertilizer. Uh, the byproduct of wool production processes either breaks and draggings from the trimmings left over from shearing. So basically what's left after you chop the sheep um, fleeces or noils and carding waste from the wool spinning processes. And here you can see uh, Matchell Brothers Limited Shoddy and Mungo manufacturers in Dewsbury. And they would take in rags, put them through these machines, which were then mashed up and the fibers extracted. And you can see in the background, the fibers being spun into yarn. And that yarn was used to create, uh, to make um, military uniforms and must've been immensely scratchy. Um, but all the stuff that was uh, a byproduct of that was uh, swept up and turned into this stuff. And you can see here the women sorting rags. And this is a pile of shoddy, uh, which is used to this day um, and, and, and put on the fields. And the reason it's good, good um, fertilizer is that it's very, very rich in nitrogen. This is a, this is a theory. Uh, other people, Goodchild, uh, suggests that... Um, in fact, uh, fertilizer, the fertilizer used in the 19th century were horses, was horse manure. Um, and it was only when uh, the, the, horse, the use of horses and, uh, decreased and the use of tractors increased that they started using shoddy. I don't know, indubitably they use shoddy. So that actually is a picture of rhubarb and you might be pleased to know we can get onto railways now. Um, they're generally conservative, as I'm sure most of you know, and seldom first into new markets. And so I think it's unlikely that they provided much impetus to the fledgling rhubarb industry. And the early West Yorkshire lines, the North Midland, York and North Midland, Manchester, Leeds and Sheffield, Ashton under Line and Manchester were all opened between 1840 and 1845 and largely ran east to west. Um, although the, there was also a tenuous 14 hour link to London via Derby. Uh, but this is all there before the rhubarb industry had, uh, had um, 
really began to exist. Um, and the GNR provided direct link, and this is the Great Northern from Leeds down here through West, West Wakefield, Westgate, and out to the, uh, what we now know as the Great Eastern down here on the right, not the Great Eastern, the, um, the, East, the, the East Coast Main Line. Uh, the GNR provided direct link to London from 1850 via Doncaster to Maiden Lane and later King's Cross. The Midland Railway also provided a link to Euston via Rugby from 1851 and to King's Cross via Hitchin using Great Northern metals from 1858. So the opportunity to export perishable goods relatively rapidly to London existed from the 1850s. Uh, but despite that early infrastructure, the first record of forced rhubarb railway transport to the capital is in the Gardener's Chronicle of December 1878, uh, a date which conforms with Goodchild's theories on forcing shed development. So by the 1880, there's, there's uh, developed forcing sheds and there's also railway traffic taking place. The Gardener's Chronicle article is slightly ambiguous as it's uncertain whether it refers to the first transport of rhubarb to London or the transport of the first produce of the year. However, all these guys, Turner, Sills and Goodchild, agree that at least after 1878, 1879, rhubarb was transported from West Yorkshire to London, although not necessarily on dedicated trains. Uh, in contrast, <coughs> Silson does argue that the railways had carried rhubarb to Manchester on an ad hoc basis as early as 1870. And I think that's actually possible as uh, this station here, Ardsley, which was a major, became a major, major goods uh, point, uh, opened in 1857. Um, I think it is likely that the railways were uninterested in providing dedicated services until sufficient volume had built to make bulk transport worthwhile. I think also it's possible that the growers who um, didn't want to spend money unnecessarily were content with local markets until increased production made selling further afield attractive. And, and of course, the rail grower relationship is another area of further study. And it's worth remembering that in the late 19th century, if you wanted to sell your product in London, this was the only way of doing it. And in London, locally grown unforced rhubarb had been marketed since the 1830s. And this steadily developed, doubtless assisted by a Royal Horticultural Society rhubarb trials held in 1882, which Turner argues did much to formalize the industry. And conforming as this did with the likely 1878 start of rail transport, it might have done much to encourage a growing London market. So I think the railways didn't make the rhubarb industry arrive. I think that they help, helped it develop considerably because obviously you can see here the Leeds and East Coast mainline route to London was uh, in place, ready, waiting, and uh, in the time scale we're talking about down here, um, the King's Cross goods yard was in full swing by 1852 and uh, the, the, uh, the Midland of course didn't arrive in Summerstown until much later. But it's indubitable that by 1914, Leeds was the greatest rhubarb growing centre in the world, and that's by an order of magnitude. Uh, something like 80 or 90% apparently of all the forced rhubarb in the world came from um, the, this area. And it was also evident that there was a significant uh, effort by the GNR to transport rhubarb around the country, particularly to London. So, uh, it's worth looking here about uh, uh, to how they did it, because the transport of uh, perishable goods um, was something that the railways were very good at. Uh, and there is nothing recorded about the advent of the so-called rhubarb expresses until a 1905 Leeds Mercury article. Um, and again, it's not clear that this recorded the beginning of the expresses, and Silson believes it could have been any time from 1896 onward that the service began. But um, what happened was from December to March, the forced rhubarb growers, uh, would have taken their produce to the local station. And this is a 1932 LNER magazine a picture of a lorry. Um, and in fact, these boxes are not rhubarb, unfortunately, they're flowers in French drove. Um, they would have been picked up either by the railway company and taken to the local station, or more likely in the at the end of the 19th century, taken by the farmer, and the grower to these local station and, and put into these 10 ton vans. Um, which uh, would have been picked up by the local pickup freight and taken to Ardsley or Leeds and concentrated into an express freight. Uh, and I think this was a relatively inefficient method of transporting rhubarb because rhubarb was um, transported in 14 pound boxes, which were cardboard, and the rhubarb was wrapped in blue paper. Now these vans were uh, 17 feet by 10 feet by seven feet high and they're nationally 10 ton 
plans. But it is believed that you didn't get to rhubarb stashed in these any higher than um, three high. So you'd have had a, a cardboard box on the bottom layer, if you like, with with, with, a, with two stone on top of it. Um, if you put much more, it would have crushed. So these vans, we believe, took about three tons each. Uh, it was concentrated at Ardsley into uh, a, an express freight, which left Ardsley at 9.12 in the evening and arrived at uh, King's Cross Goods Station at uh, two o'clock in the morning. Uh, and whence it was, uh, from whence it was, it was uh, sorted, unloaded, sorted, and distributed to the local markets, either by horse and cart or, or, or more, more lately uh, by the familiar mechanical horses. Um, and this was a process that was pretty similar from the late 19th century all the way through to uh, certainly nationalization. And the complexity of it is demonstrated by the fact that at nationalization in 1948, the British Transport Commission inherited uh, 12,300 vehicles 7,400 horses, well, I won't read it all, um, but you can see that this is a hugely uh, complicated and very large operation, uh, very costly, and um, it was quite hard to make money out of, I would have thought. And this whole process was actually described um, in the March 1932 LNER magazine in some detail by um, a man called K.A. Kinden, who was a night clerk in charge at King's Cross Goods. Um, and he confirms uh, that even in 1932, the 9, 12 p.m. departure from Ardsley was, was running. And in fact, um, it had been running for many, many years. So uh, King's Cross, uh, this is probably familiar to many of you, but um, this is the goods yard uh, and the, the, where the rhubarb would have arrived. This is what you now know as York Way. And in those days, uh, in 1890, it was known as uh, York Road. Um, before that, it was Maiden Lane, and Maiden Lane uh, station was up here. Uh, and in 1852, this opened and the, the station opened. And this is down here, it's with, uh, showing it pretty much in its familiar form, except that we have uh, Foster's uh, booking hall uh, to the left. And we see here St Pancras, which arrived in 1868, a long time after King's Cross was there. And the Summerstown, Summerstown Goods Yard here on the left, which is now known as the British Library, uh, arrived in 1887. So uh, the uh, Great Northern had a great advantage over, um, over the Midland for the purposes of this traffic. One, the more direct route, and two, it was there first. Uh, along here is the Regent's Canal, um, and the rhubarb would have been uh, unloaded and transshipped onto road and canal, and uh, this was an extremely busy um, and, and very, very uh, heavily worked, worked area. Um, and uh, would have been taken, the, the rhubarb would have been taken to uh, it, its various destinations. And the scene inside um, the, the good shed would have looked something like this. Uh, this actually is in about 1910. Um, and you can see the variety of goods. Uh, some of this may be rhubarb, they could be rhubarb boxes, but I'm not sure. Um, and the reason that they're so complicated was that, of course, the Railway and Canal Traffic Act in 1854 uh, absolutely enacted uh, common carrier provisions, which meant the railways had to carry anything in the, from anywhere in the UK to anywhere else in the UK at published rates. But I think this, this demonstrates the complexity. The rhubarb train would arrive, each of these vans would probably have three tons of rhubarb in them, going to many, many, many different markets. And of course, the main markets were Borough, uh, Spitalfields, um, Smithfield, uh, and so on, Covent Garden. And uh, they would have to be sorted and then put on wagons and taken to the right, right location. Um, and this went on uh, right up until uh, after, well, up to beaching, really. The, um, of course, this, this actually isn't. King's Cross, it's Paddington in 1910, so I apologize for that, but I couldn't find a picture of King's Cross. But the principle is amply demonstrated by, by Paddington. So I think what we're gonna do now is recap. Uh, I am. Uh, in 1850, the Great Northern Railway uh, from Leeds to London, the route opened to Maiden Lane. In 1852, the King's Cross Goods Yard and the King's Cross Passenger Station opened and, 
The Midland Railway wasn't in evidence until 1887 at the Summerstown Goods Yard. The first mention of rail transported rhubarb to London was in 1878 in the Gardener's Chronicle. So uh, it took a long time for the railways to start shipping this stuff down to London. The first mention of rhubarb expresses in 1905. So the dedicated, if it was dedicated, um, transport didn't happen until much later. Uh, by 1914, Leeds was producing more rhubarb than anywhere else in the world. World War I saw the volume of railborne goods into London doubled, and I have absolutely no reason to believe that rhubarb was any different. Um, and and uh, the book, An Immense and Exceedingly Commodious Goods, Goods Station, is, is a very interesting uh, work, um, which came about because of the archaeological investigations that had been carried out from the redevelopment of the King's Cross Goods Station area. Um, in 1923, grouping occurred, and the LNER, continued forced rhubarb freight from West Yorkshire. And uh, of course, even in 1923, rail was preeminent for long distances. The, despite the growth of lorries, which was beginning to happen then, uh, the, the maximum daily distance was about 60 to 80 miles. And the, the road infrastructure was extremely uh, un, uh, undeveloped. Um, so this went on quite happily up till war uh, in 1939. Um, and the Second World War uh, had a, a very large, impact on the rhubarb trade. The exact size of that impact, impact depends on who you believe. But um, we've already spoken about the Ministry of Food turning forced rhubarb into green top jam and grubbing up the roots. Um, and uh, this is cut to counteract uh, wartime shortages of, of, of fruit. Uh, but I think that must have been rather unpleasant. I certainly don't remember, I'm, I'm not old enough to remember it, but um, some of you might, I guess, but it must have been horrible given the shortage of sugar during the war and this stuff i suspect put an entire generation off rhubarb probably including david although he's not that old either um green green rhubarb on the other hand was an absolute staple diet and was price controlled and they they got all the ministry of food took all they could get and sent it around the country um fuel shortage obviously inhibit the forcing sheds and uh, labor shortages uh, obviously impact industry. And rail transport remains preeminent for long distance, road, pe uh, road, petrol and horse, obviously for short distances. And there were, there's a significant number of horses still being used even at this, this date. Now, many people argue that after the war, the industry plummeted uh, for various reasons. One, Leeds had been bombed quite heavily and there's a lot of land outside Leeds which had been forced rhubarb, which was redeveloped in 45. Um, others, including Silson, uh, say that the, rail, the, the, the industry stayed uh, strong until the late 60s. Um, and I found a load of information in math for, uh, in the archive, which actually indicates that Anthony Silson is right. And this is the data I unearthed. And so you can see that in 1945, we've got about 6,000 tons of forced rhubarb being produced uh, which rose to this strange outlier in 1953, where, uh, where nearly 9,000 tons of, of rhubarb were produced. Now, I don't know why that is. I couldn't find out why that is, but I wondered whether it was a really bad weather year, which the rhubarb loved. It was certainly the year of the floods, the great floods in East Anglia, um, but I, I don't know. But it is, a, it is a math figure in the archive, and in fact, the blue figures are actual numbers I found in, in Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries files, and the, the green figures are interpolations between fixed points. So I, I think this is a reasonable picture. But you can see after 1953, uh, we went back to about 6,000 tonnes a year until 1966, 67, when it begins to, to fall off. Um, and this figure here equates to a yield of about 103 tonnes per acre of forcing shed. And the usual uh, yield per acre of forcing, forcing shed is, is in the order of uh, 70 to 80 tonnes a year, which actually fits with these, with these figures here. So uh, it's useful to think about those figures, and then we'll examine the next stage of uh, railway development, which was nationalisation leading up to beaching, so 45 to 62. So in 1945, the post-war railways were under extreme financial and operational pressures, uh, as you know. Uh, the Luftwaffe had um, had a go at them, and actually, I think the government had had a go at them. Um, maintenance was curbed, and uh, the finance was uh, not really reimbursed as as, as was uh, promised. Um, and Attlee wins a landslide election in 1945 with an absolute manifesto for 
the nationalization of the means of production and the means uh, uh, and, and all inland transport, which they promptly set about doing. As you know, 1948 nationalization prompted the need for rail economies, birth of British Transport Commission and the common carrier principle not removed. And the reasons for the rail economies were firstly, uh, the, the, the maintenance backlog was, was going to cause huge problems. Secondly, uh, the railways were, of course, saddled with the debt uh, that was used to buy off the shareholders from the, uh, the, the, the pre-nationalisation companies. Um, and the, the British Transport Commission was tasked with uh, making the railways break even, uh, taking one year with another, which I'm never quite sure what that meant. And uh, I think quite crucially as well, the common carrier principle was not removed, meaning that they had to continue with this immensely complicated um, method of moving uh, uh, wagon load freight and sundry freight around the country. Um, in 1951 to 1955, the Tories came back to power under Churchill, then Anthony Eden, and then Macmillan in 55, and they win elections. And the British Transport Commission's figures are, are plummeting. Uh, they, they're making deficits all through this period, and the Tories, understandably, not being particularly friendly to nationalization, and um, were, began to become rather impatient with it. Um, 1955, the, the, the 19 the nineteen day Aslef rail strike, it was, wasn't it, encouraged a, a switch to road transport, as many scholars have, have shown. Um, and uh, in the 1955 modernization plan, which was British Rail's argument, which is British Rail's answer to uh, the disquiet shown by the, the Tories, put forward a 1.2 billion at 1955 prices, uh, project or program of work to uh, dieselize, get rid of steam, electrify, uh, and uh, many other um, modernization aspects. But crucially, there was a very large program of work to modernize the entire method of, of, of moving freight around. And that included closing lots of good stations and closing lots of, uh, um, uh, lots of uh, marshalling yards. And the modernization plan, in fact, was going to build 32 new yards, modernize 26 of them and close 195. And in the triangle, that meant the concentration of freight would happen at Leeds and Wakefield. Uh, there was a new yard at Healy Mills, um, which is near Wakefield. So this began a sort of closure, which was beginning to take uh, service away from the Yorkshire rhubarb growers. Continuing the theme, 1945 to 1966, of course, we know the growth of the road network and freight vehicles. And in 1959, um, the M1 arrived in Birmingham. The 1962 Transport Act heralds beaching and the final removal of the common carrier principle, which, of course, enabled British railways not to carry everything they were asked to. But it was a bit late. Um, and uh, by this time, post-war, there was a growing power of retailers over suppliers, um, and they were weighing, uh, although it was happening slowly, they were beginning to uh, flex their muscles over, over suppliers. So the closure of stations such as Ardsley, which closed in 1964, uh, prompts growers to handle rhubarb once. The M1 opens in 59 uh, to Birmingham, the M1 leads extension in 1969, and in 1970, the M62 and uh, the M1 crossed each other at a place called, um, I've forgotten what it's called, it's near Ardsley. Um, London markets begin to consolidate and relocate. 1968, the last rhubarb was rail transported to London. So the picture is obvious. Services are being taken away and the rail, uh, the rail transport of rhubarb is under pressure. And this is a picture of the stations closed in the rhubarb triangle from 1950 up until 1962. So in 1950, there were 75 stations in that rhubarb triangle area I showed you. Um, and uh, this is the last Labour government in 1951. That's Churchill coming back. Uh, and that's Macmillan. And this is also Macmillan. And uh, from between 1950 and 1962, nearly half of all the stations in the rhubarb triangle closed. And that actually must have had a very, very significant impact on the growers because either they had to go further to take their stations to what used not to be a local station, or they'd have gone to, to, to Leeds or um, well, Ardsley and later uh, Wakefield. Um, and all oh, British Rail had to do it, British Railways had to do it, thus increasing their costs. So I think it's a fairly significant um, figure. Now, there's also the technological developments uh, of the um, 
modernization plan. And uh, it is interesting to look at those because this is a pickup goods which you've seen before, which dated from 1932. And this is a pickup goods going through a, a rhubarb triangle station, in fact, in 1962. And I defy you to see any difference. Um, and so there's all this money being spent on marshalling yards. And this was the stuff they were still using. So uh, one wonders about the, 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 um, the propriety of that expenditure. And down here, this is the familiar flower lorry from French Drove in Lincolnshire, although it had been the same lorry carting rhubarb around uh, in 1934, 32. And this uh, is a 1960 lorry at Woodlesford, which is again a, a station in the, in the rhubarb triangle. And you can see that the, the lorries have progressed somewhat more than, than the pickup goods system. And uh, this is reflected, I think, in the, the figures that we see for uh, railway. Um, uh, versus road ton miles. It was 1952, the railways were, were, were carrying something like 42%, uh, uh, their market share was 42% of 54 mil, thousand million ton miles of freight, uh, and that fell to 22% in 1964 uh, of uh, uh, a total market that had actually increased by uh, almost 50% at that stage. So you can see the writings on the wall here. And uh, Beeching's uh, impact that we, and the rationalization of, rationalization of rail assets from 62 to 1970. Uh, rail freight stations and depots, 1962, there were still 5,000 or so. And by 1970, there were 600. Uh, marshalling yards, there were 600, 146. Route mileage, uh, down to nearly just under, just a, a, under 12,000. And uh, the, the numbers of freight vehicles absolutely um, uh, slashed. So the remaining freight handling at Leeds and Healy Mills uh, forced growers to pay BR for transport to railheads or to do it themselves over longer distances. And you can see they began to think, I'll just put it in a lorry and take it to London. Uh, and if we actually look here at uh, forced rhubarb compared to hull fish, we've got our familiar production figures here. And this black line is the amount of rail produced, rail, rail transported rhubarb. Um, and in 19, I haven't got the figure before 1953, unfortunately, uh, because it's fairly scarce. But you can see that in 53, with that big outlier, something like three quarters of all, um, all uh, rhubarb was transported by rail, forced rhubarb. And uh, the next year, 54, it was still about three quarters and then began to drop off. Uh, and there's an inexorable fall in, uh, in rhubarb to 1968 when it wasn't there anymore. So the rhubarb, the rhubarb growers were voting with their feet from as early as 1954. And I think they were being forced out and we'll compare this to the uh, station closures in the uh, rhubarb triangle in a minute. But if you compare that to hull fish, and this is some figures composed by Martin Wilcox. Uh, in 1948, uh, all hull fish landed was rail transported. And in 1962, only a quarter of it was rail transported. Um, the shape of the market is slightly different because these were all small growers and producing rhubarb. Uh, in terms of fish, uh, something like 50% of the total fish uh, produced was handled by about 10% of the companies, the big, the big ones like McFisheries and Ross and uh, Birdseye. Um, and there, were, there was considerable disquiet around this period with um, uh, arguments between the suppliers and uh, British Rail, British Railways, uh, British Railways owned the docks and they, they were charging, uh, they were charging people extortionate rents. And they even were trying to force people out who, who used road transport at the time. So I think him, McFisheries and co voted with their feet and uh, physically decided that they were going to take it to the railways because they didn't like what was going on. And here in the rhubarb world, I think the, um, the, the rhubarb growers voted with their feet because the service had been just taken away from them or, and they could see the writing on the wall. Um, so here's the forced rhubarb production versus station closures and our familiar blue Tory governments. And then this is Harold Wilson arriving and Harold Wilson surviving. And then this is, um, I can't remember, it must have been Thatcher, was it? Yes, it was, no, it wasn't. Um, can't remember which Tory government that was. Get up. 1916, Edward Heath, silly me, sorry. Um, so you can see our familiar figures here uh, and uh, 
1953, you can see the stations closing, and by 1962, nearly half the stations had gone. Uh, and funnily enough, this is when Mr. Beeching arrived, or Lord Beeching, and by 64, 65, of course, he'd resigned as, as chairman of British Rail because uh, he didn't get on with the Labour government. Um, and, and I think Dudley and Richardson talk about the hollow core. And he found here with Ernest Marple's Minister of Transport, he filled the hollow core. And here uh, he had the hollow core taken away with him. But the interesting thing, of course, is that Labour continued the, the closures. So the upshot in the rhubarb triangle is by 1968, uh, only 19 of the original 75 triangle stations remained. And impacts on road can be seen uh, down here. We have 22% uh, uh, of, of the market was uh, shared by rail in 1964, and that fell to 15% uh, in uh, 1972. So uh, if we summarize that picture of rhubarb, uh, you can see that uh, in 1948, the, uh, the, there were quite a few acres of rhubarb and it fell to only a few, 480 by 1970. Uh, and in fact, now there are only 10 growers left. Uh, rail handled rhubarb from West Yorkshire between 63 and 69, fell off a cliff. Um, and these are all figures from my mentor here, uh, Tony Silson. Um, the Barker and Gerhold figures demonstrate the fall in, in rail uh, transported freight between 64 and 68. Oh dear, sorry about that. And the rise in the number of goods vehicles uh, from 1946 to 65 showed a rise to over 24,000 from 1,000 eight tonne vehicles. And there were 530,000 to 1.5 million goods vehicles in the same period. So road is on the rise, as we know. British Railways uh, in 1968-69 handled only 10,000 of a total of half a million rhubarb boxes um, transported in the UK. So it really did uh, disappear quite quickly. And uh, I said I'd talk about thoughts on retail development. Now, I don't think the supermarkets had anything to do with the demise of rail transported rhubarb. rhubarb because uh, the supermarkets came to very slowly to the UK after the Second World War, the co-op and Sainsbury's starting them. Uh, but their developments were constrained by rationing and building material quotas, and also by regulation. They weren't allowed to compete on price. They had to sell goods at the supplier recommended prices. And uh, although the economic logic for supermarkets is, is compelling, um, the economic uh, benefit because they can't um, access the economies of scale and pass savings on to customers and until the abolition of RPM in 1964, I think is, is, is generally accepted by many scholars. Uh, the, RP, the impact of RPM is sudden. Um, 60, 1962, about a thousand rhubarb, rhubarb, UK supermarkets, growing to 3,000 in 1970. But I don't think it had any impact on rail transported rhubarb as rail transport ended by 68. However, um, they did have, I have absolutely no doubt that there was a massive ongoing uh, impact on, on people like rhubarb growers uh, as, as the power of supermarkets uh, grew and grew. Um, and we can see that uh, in, I think in some sort of response to this, the rhubarb uh, growers migrated to the, um, to the supermarket, to the motorway intersections. And you can see here in 1970, this is the rhubarb growing areas and they're all were on the motorways except for this little bit up here near Pudsey. And uh, this uh, was the picture you saw earlier with Loft House, which is actually where that intersection of the M62 and the M1 is. And you can see the contraction of the rhubarb growing areas. And the only stations left uh, on this map that are shown that are in this area are Leeds, Dewsbury, Wakefield, Westgate, and I know there's Wakefield, Kirkgate as well, and, and New Pudsey. So I think uh, the demise of rail wasn't a function of the supermarkets. The demise of the industry, leaving only 10 now is. And I'm finally going to just talk a little bit about extending this to, to seasonal produce. Um, I, I spoke earlier about Roger Miles's uh, Food Miles case study. Um, which is a road-based food distribution study uh, on um, the, the meat, milk, and confectionery industry and their approach to the changing universe. Uh, 
and uh, it's a very, very comprehensive work. Um, and I'm going to use a similar case study uh, approach because I think Thomas has, has demonstrated the benefit of it. But I'm going to look at small and locally significant producers who had no power, such as the Cheddar Gorge strawberry growers, Channel Island tomatoes, soft fruit from Scotland and Cornish broccoli. And I'll chart the demise of local seasonal produce uh, and the impact of growing power of retailers and the subject itself, I think, is hardly touched by scholars. And this will bring together food mobility, road rail logistics, retail and seasonality for the UK as a whole. At least that's the plan. I'm six weeks into it, or is it seven? So um, it's early days and I've, I've messed around with a research question, but it's probably completely irrelevant and I'm sure it'll change many times between now and uh, it's actually I've got six years to do it in. So we'll see what happens. That's my talk. Thank you for listening. Um, I think I might have run over, but apologies if that's the case. So I'll answer any questions, or I'll attempt to answer any questions, if indeed there are any. Thank you very much, Owen. Uh, that was really excellent.